Welcome to the module about oral architecture and reflective acoustics. So I'd like to start by observing that sound is inherently spatial, especially when, but not only when, we are talking about acoustic sound. That is to say, sound as vibrating air or vibrating objects. So if we think about something like a string on a guitar or a violin or the string inside of a piano or even perhaps our vocal cords as a kind of string, this is not simply um, a point in the air that is vibrating, but rather a whole series of connected points that are vibrating together in a complex pattern. The vibrations go back and forth down the string generally. If we think about something like a drum, or the head of a drum, this um, two-dimensional, perhaps circular surface, and then we strike the drum, and then those pressure waves, those vibrations, move out across the surface of the drum. When we think about these examples, it becomes clear that we don't ever really have sound in one one point in space, we always have sound at lots of different connected points in space. Um, we might even think about the situation of a sound source and a listener. Now, they can't be in the same place. The sound source has to be at some distance from the point that we're calling the listener, whether that's a human ear or a microphone. And the energy from that sound source has to travel through space in order to arrive at the ear. It's clear that we're always dealing with a spatial phenomenon. And the case of reverberation, which is really an important part of this week's module, um, is uh, highlights this. When we're talking about reverberation, we're usually talking more narrowly about all of the phenomena that come from the reflection and absorption by nearby surfaces of sound energy. So if we imagine that we're um, talking and listening in a room, and the room might have a wall that's made of brick, and a door that's made of glass, and a floor that's made of carpet, and of, and of course a, a whole bunch of air as well. Um, when we make a sound in that room, what a listener is going to get is not going to be that sound as it exists at its point of origin, but it's going to get that sound as modulated by all of the reflections and absorptions that happen as that sound energy bounces around this real space with all of its real materials. So this has an impact on on really all of the stages and all of the and many of the tasks of audio work. Um, for example, whenever we are making recordings, our recordings happen in space and our recordings are going to receive all those reflections and absorptions that are inherent in the spaces that we're working in. Also, if we're recording, we might deliberately choose to record in a space that has a particular um, set of surfaces and a particular profile of reflection and absorption because we like the sound or because it serves some creative need. When we're mixing or transforming an audio project, we might deliberately want to add um, certain kinds of simulated or real reflections and absor absorptions to the work that we're doing. Um, in another module, we'll talk about artificial reverberation. But even if we don't want to add artificial reverberation, it still affects our work at the mixing and transformation stage of a project, because um, while we're working on mixing or transforming a project, we again are listening in some kind of space. And um, as the sounds that we're listening to, let's say, come out of loudspeakers while we're working, they, they also bounce around the room in which we're listening and are absorbed to some or other extent um, by the walls and the other surfaces of that room. So it, it plays a um, potentially distorting role um, with respect to what is in the underlying text of the audio that we're working on.
And a similar thing happens when a listener receives the audio signals that we're working on for them. Our, our listeners may listen um, to our sounds in an environment that we control, or they may listen to it in all kinds of diverse environments as part of their um, everyday lives. In all cases, though, the sounds that are reprojected out of loudspeakers or even headphones are subject to the, to the acoustics and the reflections and the absorptions um, inherent in all of those situations. So reverb is, is important, and it's something that um, we can engage with in different ways and that we, that we can't escape from. Um, and it's also part of a sort of a larger set of questions, um, which some are starting to call oral architecture, um, after this influential book by Barry Blesser and Linda Ruth Salter, "Spaces Speak: Are You Listening? Experiencing Oral Architecture," and um, that book um, really sketches the outline of a broad interdisciplinary field of study um, that different um, stakeholders might be interested in for different reasons and at different times. Um, for example, sound artists might be really interested in the way that um, sound behaves in different spaces and different architectures because they want to imitate those effects or because they want to take advantage of them or exaggerate them or choose to work in certain spaces in their work. Um, acousticians are people who um, stereotypically um, are hired to, to do things that control the acoustics of new spaces that are built, um, like new lecture halls or concert halls or, or perhaps offices or other everyday spaces. Um, and they too have to think about the complex set of effects that come from um, the way that architecture and the built and not built environment affects what we hear. Public communicators, teachers, and performers um, might be interested in oral architecture because their performances before an audience um, don't arrive at the audience in some direct form. They, they arrive in a way that is modulated by the space in which they are speaking, are performing. And perhaps anthropologists will be interested in, or, in oral architecture too. Um, after all, um, across a broad um, cross-section of different human cultures, we see cultures creating spaces that exaggerate certain characteristics of, of sound or um, which suppress reverberation or which exaggerate reverberation um, in particular ways. Um, many human cultures have been aware of and engaging with oral architecture for, um, for a very long time. And there are probably others as well. So I want to turn back now to, um, to reverberation, to the specific set of things that happen when we make a sound in a space where there are surfaces around that can reflect and absorb that acoustic energy. And um, there are lots of ways we could think about this, but for the purposes of this course, um, I'm going to take a kind of three-stage model of reverberation. And um, these two diagrams show the three-stage model in two different ways. So imagine, first of all, that we have a sound source somewhere in a room. Here's our four walls. And imagine somewhere else we have a listener, which could be a human ear, could be a microphone. And then one other thing that we need to take as a given before talking through this three-stage model is that the speed of sound is relatively constant. For example, at sea level with dry air and 20 degrees Celsius, the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. That's a very useful um, number to remember because occasionally making calculations with that number um, can help solve uh, or illuminate certain problems. But to make that story short, um, sound has a, essentially a constant speed in a given situation um, without regard to frequency. So that means that how long it takes a sound to go a certain distance is something that we can predict, and that when distances are longer, 
it will take longer for the sound energy to get there. So now we get into the three-stage model. We have a source that puts some sound energy into a room. And that sound energy is going to go out in all directions from the source. But from the standpoint of the listener, the first thing that's going to happen, their first awareness, their first possibility for awareness of this sound energy is going to be the awareness that results from this direct wave arriving at them on the shortest path between the source and the listener, right? If the listener is somewhere in the room and the source is somewhere in the room, there's going to be some kind of shortest path between the two. And because the speed of sound is constant, the energy is going to arrive along that path before it arrives along any other paths. So if we have over here on the right a graph of what the listener receives, um, if the original sound looks something like that, the original sound signal, perhaps the de direct wave a moment later when it arrives at the listener will look, um, will look similar. Of course, it will be the energy of the sound source at, at its original location will be greater than the energy of that sound source when it arrives as the direct wave at the listener. So that's the first thing that happens, is that the direct wave arrives at the listener. And then, typically, there are a bunch of early reflections that arrive. So this is stage two. So here's an example of an early reflection path here. It's um, a reflection off a wall that's pretty close to the listener and reasonably close to the source. And if we look at this path that I'm sketching out here with the mouse, we can see that this path is somewhat longer than the path of the direct wave, but not too much longer, right? And if we were to sketch out a lot of uh, the other possible reflection paths here, we would find that they would all be of pretty, you know, pretty similar length to this one in a typical room and a typical source listener arrangement. And so at a moment later then from the direct wave, we get a bunch of early reflections that arrive across different reflection paths. And then, somewhat arbitrarily, um, we transition into a third stage, um, which we're calling late reflections. We get these reflections that go off multiple sources. They take much, much longer to arrive at the listener. Um, there are potentially many more of these paths, if we think about it. So there's probably lots of these reflections. They have to go a much further distance uh, in order to arrive at the listener. So they're much, much smaller, but there's many of them. And they all kind of blend together, and we get the late reflections. Now, in the acoustics of the real world, things are not always as neatly divided as these, these three phases, but it's still a pretty good approximation for understanding um, what's going on. And one other thing I want to say about this three-stage model before moving on to the next slide is that um, we're really, in what we said a second ago, we were really emphasized reflection, but actually every time the sound energy reaches one of these surfaces, the surfaces also absorb some acoustic energy. And how much um, acoustic energy they absorb depends on the frequency, and it also depends on the nature of the surface. Different materials will absorb more, um, and, and other materials will absorb less. For example, stone uh, is something that is very, very reflective, so it doesn't absorb much at most frequencies. Um, carpet is something that is pretty absorptive, so it tends to absorb a lot of acoustic energy, and so on and so forth. So the actual pattern, then, of direct wave and early reflections and late reflections that arrive at the listener is a reflection of the space, its shape, it's a, a reflection of the position of the source and listener in that space, and it's a reflection of the characteristics of all those materials as well. So there's a lot of complexity there, um, but our brain is able to pay attention to that and gives us distinct uh, spatial perceptions and impressions from all of that complexity, which is a, a kind of amazing thing, um, but also not that surprising when you think about the fact that um, we have evolved in a world that is full of sound and full of listening. So it's not that surprising that, um, that we hear lots of things. So one of the things that we hear 
in reverberation is how long it takes for the sound, for all those reflections to decay away. And there's a standard measurement that is sometimes used to describe this, this situation, and that's called RT60. And it's the time that it takes for the sound pressure level to decrease by 60 decibels um, in a given spatial configuration of source, room, and listener. So say, for example, we make some kind of loud sound, 90 decibels SPL, and then stop making that sound. And now that sound continues to reverberate around the room for some period of time. And eventually, we get to a point where the, those, those, all of those reflections and all of that reverberation, um, the level of that has come down to 30 decibels SPL. So the time that it takes to go from that 90 decibels SPL level to the 30 DS decibels SPL level, we would call that the RT60 for this particular situation. This is also sometimes abbreviated T60, uh, and it's frequency dependent. So um, every uh, space will have a some, at least somewhat different RT60 at different frequencies because, as we saw in the previous slide, the materials in the room respond differently at different frequencies. The air also responds differently at different frequencies. High frequencies are attenuated more rapidly um, as sound travels through the air. Typical values for RT60 are in the range of 0 to 15 seconds or so. Um, 15 seconds would be uh, a very, very, very long reverberation, like a, a massive cathedral or a huge, very reflective cave or something like that. And the values that we might get for um, sort of everyday things like offices and rooms and stuff like that would be often under a half second or, or under um, uh, even smaller amounts than that. So this measure, RT60, the last thing that I want to say about it is that this was introduced by uh, a pioneer of architectural acoustics working at the end of the 19th century, Wallace Clement Sabine. Um, and Sabine introduced a formula at that time that related the reverb time of a room to its, um, to its surface area, to its volume, uh, and to various coefficients that reflected the characteristics of, um, of the surfaces around. So that work has continued to be very influential for acousticians and for, you know, and for, for people who are designing acoustic spaces. But I think for people that are working creatively with sound, it's important to keep in mind that we hear a lot of other things beyond um, RT60 time. For example, we also hear really important cues about the nature of materials. We, we hear the difference in reverberation between wood and glass and stone and metal and fabric and snow and water. And these things can be really meaningful to us as artists and as listeners. Um, we definitely hear cues about the distances between objects in scenes and between objects and surfaces in scenes. We hear boundary proximity effects. For example, if we um, walk at a wall with our eyes closed but our ears open, um, we may be able to find that just by our sense of hearing alone, we're able to stop without hitting the wall because that we hear um, how the acoustics change when we're in really close proximity to that boundary. Um, there are things like echoes um, that are often um, given uh, great cultural significance. And we also hear localized differences in reverberation. Um, rooms don't have the same reverb characteristics and in every position in them. And, and really what we're looking at is a relationship between a sound source and a listener in a particular room. And as we move about the room, as we move about the space, we can become aware of the way those properties change. These are all things, everything on this slide, are things that people working with sound creatively can exploit for their own artistic and communicative purposes. So to summarize what we've talked about in this module, sound is inherently spatial, and reverberation, what the, the phenomena that result from reflections and absorptions um, of sound and um, when it hits surfaces, is something that's very salient to us, something that we pay a lot of attention to.
Oral architecture is a larger set of concerns around that. Um, we talked about the three-stage model of reverberation, which describes what happens acoustically um, when a sound is made and reaches a listener across many different reflective and absorptive paths through a room. We saw that RT60 is one way to talk about the characteristics of reverberation. It describes the decay time of reverberation, but we also saw that there were many more things in reverberation than just its decay time, and we can listen to and potentially artistically exploit those things as well.